Hello, everyone. Welcome to the Future Work Pioneers podcast. Today, we are speaking with Dave Ulrich, who is a professor at the Ross School of Business at the University of Michigan and a partner at the RBL Group. He studies how organizations build capabilities of leadership, speed, learning, accountability, and talent by leveraging human resources. Dave has published over 200 articles in book chapters and over 25 books. He edited Human Resource Management from 1990 to 1999, served on the board of directors of Herman Miller and board of trustees at Southern Virginia University. He's a fellow at the National Academy of Human Resources. Professor Ulrich, welcome to the show. Harpreet, what a privilege to join you. Thank you. And it's so so delightful uh, to welcome you into my office. Uh, I don't get to do that very often, and I get to see you in your office. So thank you. Thank you for joining us again. So let's start with your background. Uh, How did you become interested in human resources and uh, the uh, idea of building organizations? Perhaps you can give us some background. You bet. Um, Decades ago, (laughs) and I'm old, when I was at the university, I was on my way to law school. I happened to take a class or a course in what's called organizational behavior or OB from a professor who captured my imagination. He said to me, uh, to the students, show me what you've learned about the organizations where you live, where you work, where you play, where you worship, and study the settings. I got captured. I was an English major, and so every paper I wrote in English that term was focused on organizations. I remember the first, one of the early ones was Beowulf, the ideal organization man, based on a sociologist. Uh, the sources of power in Paradise Lost. And I, I cheated. I turned them into my English professor, and I turned them into my organizational behavior professor. The English professor said, what are you doing? And my organizational professor said, that's fantastic. And so for him, I ended up submitting, I think, 12, 15-page papers in the semester. And he called me, and he said, don't go into law. Go into OB. And I remember calling my mom and my dad and saying, I'm going into OB. And they thought it was obstetrics, (laughs) so I would be a doctor, and they were so thrilled. And I said, it's organizational behavior, and they said, what's that? And I said, I have no clue, but I love it. And uh, that was it. My wife, uh, who's a very good psychologist, says I have OCD, which is organization compulsive disorder. Uh, I look at any organization, even decades later, and try to fix them. In fact, this weekend, we were attending um, a church service. And on the way home, I started saying what the minister could have done to to make the service more effective. And she said, Dave, will you ever let go? Um, I like organizations. They shape how we think, how we learn, how we behave, how we feel. And uh, that's been my passion for 40 years. This episode is brought to you by Experfy. Incubated in Harvard Innovation Lab, Experfy provides custom future of work solutions, such as private talent clouds and skill taxonomies. Experfy differentiates itself by using subject matter experts to pre-vet and pipeline candidates for AI and high-end technology skills. However, Experfy Talent Cloud Platform is skill agnostic and can be licensed to build custom talent clouds for any and all skills. In a different use case, enterprises interested in employee intermobility can license the Experfy platform to create an internal gigs marketplace where interested employees can be algorithmically matched to projects, gamifying their learning experience. Visit www.experfy.com for more information. Coming to this idea of future of work that we are discussing today, how do you think about future of work? You know, I think the future of work is such a big topic that it's, it's obviously anticipating what's next, not looking back at what's been. Uh, I think one of the frustrations I sometimes see is people talk about resilience, grit, learning, which is almost always a backward glance at what worked, what didn't, which I like. I love to anticipate what's next. I love to say, given the setting in which we live, how do we prepare for opportunities? For example, the future of work's gotten a lot of attention at Davos and other great conferences. And I think up until January of 2020, it was often around AI, digital, technology. And then suddenly the coronavirus hits, quickly followed by racial strife, not only in the United States, but around the world with refugees 
and racial issues and, and, and diversity issues everywhere, quickly followed by an economic downturn. So what I now see is how do I live with that context and discover opportunities rather than threats? Um, I believe very simply that content is king. You've got to have good content. But the context is the kingdom in which the king or queen operates. And so for me, the future of work is being able to anticipate the next context that, in which we have to operate. That was actually very convoluted. I apologize. No, no, this is, this is fascinating. So what are the different types of uh, elements when you think of a context? I, I mean, everybody's got a topology. I've been asked to work with companies and say, how do I see the future of work? I like to look at six elements. One, social trends within an industry or within a country. Uh, that could be religious trends, it could be demographic, it could be social trends. How do, we, how do we manage our people and our systems? Second is technological trends, which are huge. The digital evolution is just dominating. Third is economic trends, industries that are up or down. Uh, for example, in this coronavirus, some industries are devastated and other industries are booming. Uh, third is, uh, fourth is political trends, uh, regulatory trends, policy trends. The next one is environmental trends, taking care of the planet and social responsibility. And finally is demographic, social, technical, economic, political, environmental, demographic step. I see those six trends shaping the context or the environment in which we're likely to operate. And, and how well you see uh, organizations out there uh, preparing for this new future? <laughs> Oh, I would love to pick your brain on that because you have such a great platform. You've interviewed all these pioneers and, and those that are thinking. Um, I'll answer the question in two ways. Number one, 20, 60, 20. 20% 20 of the organization, the normal distribution, have the capacity to anticipate future. They see around the bend. They, they have agility. They, they begin to create what's next. 20% are locked into a past, sometimes because they've been successful. Uh, one of the greatest dangers is the liability of success. Our success leads us, good is the enemy of great, great is the enemy of change. And when we've been great, we don't change. And 60%, I think, are executives who, with coaching and help, can get there better. Um, I believe that the future is, is an opportunity to create something terrific. I, uh, I had a real privilege of being a mentee of C.K. Prahalad, who said, you're, you're your aspiration should exceed your resource. In other words, your aspiration for the future should exceed your current capabilities or competencies that he talked about, but not too much, because if it's too much, you get discouraged that you can't get there. And, and I think organizations have to create ways of organizing and, and behaving and managing people to not only create the future, but to shape it and create what can be. So, so uh, I, I've noticed that um, a lot of the friction that you see is in large organizations because, you know, people aren't willing to make behavioral changes. When, when you think about, you know, uh, building a culture that is attentive to these various contexts, uh, how, how do you suppose these organizations can uh, bring about that change? Great comment. And I'd love to hear your view uh, on that question. Uh, would you like me to share mine first and then yeah. you, or would you like to go first? No, no, please, please go ahead. I'll go first. And then I'd love to hear your view because I think you sit in a very unique setting. I think one of the mistakes that we make, for example, use the word culture, is we define culture from the inside out. Culture is the roots of the tree. It's our values. Well, the roots don't change. The values often don't change. In almost all of the work we've done, we define culture, talent, organization, leadership from the outside in. Culture is the identity of the firm in the mind of our targeted customers, given the changing context. So culture is not the roots of the tree. Culture are the branches and leaves and fruits of the tree. And when you define culture or talent or leadership from the outside in, it's constantly changing. Because the, the, the environment and the context creates a new pocket of opportunity, and we've got to adapt and change. And so when we get focused on ourselves, we get focused inside, we have that liability of success. Our success leads us to fail. In my work, as, a, as a, I said one day, I, I'm in the business of uh, ideation. <laughs> I love words, and so are you. I mean, I looked at your dissertation, and I would 
frankly, I didn't understand a lot of it, but, but that's, that's probably because I'm not that good. But I love the idea of words that frame our ideas, that shape how we think, how we act, and how we feel. And in my world, I hope I can create new words and new observations uh, to be very concrete. Every 18 to 24 months, I should have 25 to 30% new material. So if I do a PowerPoint presentation on leadership or culture, I believe that every 18 to 24 months, I should have 25% new slides. That sounds easy. Over a 40-year career, that's very demanding. Uh, that what I presented 10 years ago probably has some similar themes, but new insights and new ideas. So how would you answer the question? You ask a great question. How would you answer so, yeah, no, I think um, working with the large organizations, I often see that uh, there is this resistance to change. People want to maintain the status quo uh, unless there is some incentive structure, unless there is some push from the top. Um, very often you see innovation happening at the grassroots by itself, yeah. right? So, so I think uh, if, if the leadership is enlightened, and they can see the right trends, then they need to create the right circumstances with the right incentive structures. Uh, uh, because we, we are in a capitalistic economy, right? So pe people understand the language of incentives. Uh, and if you can provide that, then you, you'll see, start to see some movement happening. And it obviously takes longer in a larger organization than a smaller one, but, but it can happen. You know, what, what we found, and it's an interesting discussion, and um, it's going to go beyond this podcast for you and I, that often to create pockets of innovation or incubators of innovation, we did a book called Reinventing the Organization. You see these market opportunities and you allocate people and resources against that opportunity. And so you put together a set of people and you give them license to go do stuff. It's almost like a hub with a platform and then a spoke. Get those people out there. Give them opportunity. Let them go create. Then what we discovered is the incentive structure institutionalizes that. I like to start with the behavior and then use the incentive to reinforce the behavior that we've got. And so in the work we've done with large companies, um, and some of the most innovative are out of China, and I know they're in other countries. They'd be in Pakistan and in India, and Russia and Brazil. But we looked at Huawei. Uh, we looked at... Uh, Tencent, Alibaba, Supercell, Amazon, Facebook in the United States, Google. What they would say is, we have a set of resources, our knowledge, our talent, our people. We then will allocate them against market opportunities. So we see the context creating an opportunity, Google Maps, uh, Amazon stores. And we put people against that opportunity and go create a pod or a cell. Um, by the way, what I love about your work is your work says, Sometimes the talent for that opportunity may not be embedded in the platform. It may be contracted because the opportunity is so compelling. And then those opportunities or those cells get connected in an ecosystem. So Amazon is basically, and Google are companies or Tencent, are companies of pods and then ecosystems that connect those pods to each other. That's the organizational uh, species that we see beginning to encourage uh, the kind of innovation that's necessary for the future. Yeah, I mean, th this is that book, Innovator's Dilemma, right? Where you, you talk about this uh, liability of being successful, that yeah. uh, you have to create some alternate structures. But I, th I think the, that can only get you so far, right? But un unless there is a way to create a more common culture that spans across the organization. Absolutely. You know, what I like to, uh, and by the way, Clayton Christensen was a friend and, uh, to be honest, is so sorely missed. There are people like Clayton, and I mentioned C.K. Prahalad, who are these thought leader pioneers, uh, using your terms, to whom we are all deeply, deeply indebted. Um, again, I had the privilege of uh, C.K. as a mentor and then working with Clayton. Where I would push Clayton a little bit is what Clayton created in Innovator's Dilemma is he had a holding company. So he'd have the hub, and then he'd have these individual units out operating independently. I wouldn't disagree with that. The problem there is you had to reintegrate the unit back into headquarters. So General Motors, an uh, auto firm in the United States, obviously, went and created Saturn. And they said, we create Saturn, a new car company in a state called Tennessee, and the bad joke, and I know I will offend people here, where there's no culture to overcome. So that was a bad, bad joke. But, but you, you created this independent, isolated company, 
And Saturn was very successful. But here was the dilemma. When they tried to reintegrate the Saturn culture back into GM mothership, it didn't work. And so it got lost. So we believe there, and again, I don't disagree with a lot of Clayton stuff, but instead of creating sales as experiments that you try to reintegrate to the parrot, create a market system or, an, or a network or an ecosystem is what we called it, where you have a Saturn, you have another experiment, and you've got all these experiments connected through networks and ecosystems. That's what Amazon's done, and I think that's what Google's done. It's not a holding company. Um, but it's a separate way or different model of how we go about organizing. So you, you've talked about uh, four phases of HR uh, marked by efficiency, innovation, information, and then connection or experience. Um, help us understand, uh, unpack that a bit. You bet. Uh, these are four phases of technology enabled HR. So it's the digital world. I'm doing HR. HR for me is, this, is the set of systems and infrastructure that sustains the culture we just talked about. Phase one is efficiency. Take our current systems for staffing, training, compensation, communication, and put them on a platform. I think that's what we did a decade ago. We'd outsource HR. Uh, there were a couple of major players. As soon as I mentioned some, people get upset, but I'll mention some. You had SAP, you had Oracle, you had um, other kind of major players. Step two is innovation. Right now, Josh Burson, who's the expert in this area, said there are 2,700 new HR apps in the last two years. By the way, I get them. And people say to me, would you endorse this app? The, the cutest one, uh, about a year ago, somebody said, we have a new app. Because of facial recognition, it will take a picture of your face. It'll look at your forehead, your eyes, your ears, and it will tell you what kind of leader you are. Would you endorse our product? And my comment was, I'm the before picture, you know, because uh, like, I don't have a face for leadership. What a stupid idea. But there are a lot of apps out there that are, that are just simply innovations. I think we need to go to the third phase, which is information that enables us to get information asymmetry in the marketplace. That the goal of HR is not to have ideas but it's to have ideas that allow us to succeed in the marketplace. My colleague, Wayne Brockbank, has been brilliant. He says, in the information economy, digital and technology enables access to information. And that's what you see across the board. I believe the fourth phase with technology in HR, and we're not there yet, is experience or connection. How do I use technology-enabled connection so that we can have better experiences? We're trying. Um, when we started this interview, I said, welcome to my office. I see people all uptight about digital and virtual. You know what? The office allows us to build connections. You, you shared with me some pictures of a, a very tender picture of your, your graduation from a top university, a tender picture of you with, I've lost, uh, was it Desmond Tutu? No, that's right. By the way, what a tender picture. I have in my offices uh, thought leaders whose ideas I've relished. I think technology allows us to create experiences that connect us. So phase one is efficiency. Do the HR work more efficiently. Phase two is innovation. Create new apps. Phase three, information, which is happening today aggressively. And phase four is connection or experience. In this phase four, what exactly happens? What, what I think phase four does is it allows us to connect with each other at a different level. So it's not just sharing information. Here's my book. It's not a TED talk. And I, I think sometimes those talks and even these webinars become fairly good information sources, but get deeper. What's the emotion? What's the affect? What's the uh, empathy that we can begin to share through information? I don't know for sure how to do that. Let me be really honest. I would love to pick your brain. You've looked at the role of faith and the role of religion as part of the information. How do we do that through technology? There is something to be said about face-to-face, -face, but there's also something to be said about getting deeper. For example, in my office, you see two pictures, three pictures. I have my family. Um, Martin Luther King. I've never met Martin Luther King. I was a young man when he was uh, iconic. Sheikh Zayed. I've never met Sheikh Zayed. Both have passed away. But their ideas have shaped my affect. They've shaped how I feel, how I think. Um, in the United States, when the racial strife, the Black Lives Matters became a top issue under 
horribly horrific conditions uh, recently. <laughs> I went back and reread some of Martin Luther King's talks and his letter from the Birmingham jail just touched my soul. And, um, and I thought, you know, it's the ideas and the information, but it's created an emotional response. And I hope we can find ways to use technology to do that. Yeah, no, that, 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 that's very uh, important. Uh, so m- moving on to the next question around this idea that, in, in, that appears in your work frequently of HR outside in. Uh, c- can you shed some light it. on that? I love it. Um, I already started, but let me go back. Often we look at HR in, again, I like phases because I like to evolve work. We look at HR in terms of functional excellence that I deliver. Um, actually, we look in terms of administrative efficiency. Is HR efficient? What's our cost per hire? Functional excellence. Did I do a good job staffing, training? Uh, we look strategic HR. Did I link HR with strategy? I like to look at outside in. So if we're building better culture, I'll go back to where we started. We often love to look at culture from the inside out. What are our values? Uh, may I tell a quick story? And sure. I know it's going to be quick. Um, our son, and this is the beauty, I'm trying to show affect and emotion. Our son finished his PhD and we were so excited. And we said to our son, what do you want for a gift? And he said, I want to take my four kids to Disney World. Well, as soon as we said that, our daughter said, I want to go to Disney World. Then our daughter said, I want to go. So we showed up at Disney World with 16 people. There we are at Disney World. I can show that. Um, Three kids in diapers, 16 people. And my son said, I got to stay on property. Here's a uh, son. Oops, I'll show him again. That's son with sunglasses. That's grumpy grandfather in the back. It was horribly expensive. We got to get four rooms and, the, and, and we pay two and a half times for the rooms and I'm grouchy and it's hot and it's sweaty. And uh, this woman comes up at this picture actually and says, you were at the happiest place on earth. And I said to her, no, I'm not. <laughs> You know, I don't get to buy a car this year because I'm coming for a week or four days to Disney with these four families. We go through the day. I'm grumpy and grouchy. And then we walk into the Cinderella and Snow White pavilion. Out walks Snow White. And there's my granddaughters with Snow White. And they look at her and they look up at me and they say, Grandpa, she's real. And she is. They can touch her. Grandpa, she's beautiful. Grandpa, thank you. We love you. And I went, oh, crap. I'm going to have to come back. And we have. Now, take that story. It's a kind of personal story. But look conceptually what Disney's done. They have not created a culture as the roots of the tree. They've created an identity in the mind of their key customers, which are my granddaughters, our granddaughters, and me, the paying grandpa, so that we have an experience that is magical. For my granddaughters, it's seeing Snow White and touching and being hugged. For me, it's that my granddaughters think I'm cool. (laughs) And you know what? We've gone back. Last year, we did a Disney cruise, which cost me another car, a better car. Uh, Disney is not an accident. These guys have built a culture from the outside in. They've created a culture as an identity in the mind of their key customer that it gets their customer to behave in ways they appreciate. We may go back again this year when, uh, when we're able to travel. Now, that's outside in. You can do the same way with leadership. We wrote a book called Leadership Brand. You don't define leadership by your competencies. You define leadership by the extent to which your competencies create value for your customers. I did a book, Leadership Code. Will they create value for your investors? So those external stakeholders define culture, leadership, talent. We don't want to be the employer of choice, which is an HR legacy. We want to be the employer of choice of employees our customers would choose. And being able to get that mindset outside in changes almost entirely the uh, the HR agenda. So, so here, this sounds more that the marketing folks have a pretty central role in all of this, right? So, um, Absolutely. Yeah. That, that HR inside and marketing outside should be combined. For example, we've gone to some ad agencies, and a company is doing an advertising buy for the internet, for uh, 
whichever internet provider you want to get on Google or Bing or whatever. We've gone to that ad agency and said, you're going to spend $10 million creating an identity for Nike, for HSBC, for whatever company. Add 5%. Add 500,000 for leadership training. Because when you promise your customers innovation, uh, freshness, design innovation, whatever it is you're promising your customers, make sure you train your leaders how to do it. And so the ad agencies are now trying to say, we want a $10,500,000 buy because we will bring you not only the, uh, the identity in the marketplace, but the leadership discipline to help make that happen. I find that a remarkable, by the way, you say, how many are doing it? Not enough. I, uh, I like to create that future, but I look at that and I go resoundingly, duh, duh. Otherwise, you make promises you can't fulfill. And, and when you can fulfill the promises, you've created a leadership brand inside that reflects the brand outside. So you've raised a, a pretty important question, uh, which matters more, war on talent or uh, building high-performing, well-connected organization. So in, in this world in which talent obviously is really important, how, how would you think about this question? I don't remember, uh, Harpreet, when I looked at your research. I'm assuming you like data and statistics. Is that part of your Absolutely. bias? So do I. I mean, um, I should show, well, I'll do this. I'm trying to model this at personalization. Um, it would be fun if you had yours. This is my dissertation from decades ago. It's a numerical taxonomy. So before it was popular, I did statistics. I did tons of statistics. And just to make fun of myself and mock it, Back in my day, university microfilms sold dissertations. I got a check and I got $11.85 for my dissertation. So for two years of work, I got $11. I, uh, and I didn't cash it. I still am very proud of this work. I love data. I love data and have loved data for 40 years. We collected data from 1,200 businesses and we had two very simple questions. My fingers represent the talent. How good are the people in your business? My fist represents the organization. So you got good talent or you got good organization. By the way, we should have had leadership. We didn't separate that out, but we have talent and organization. We looked at business performance indicators and you can create your index indices of performance. And then we did a variance decomposition. We did regression. It was fascinating. What percent of business success was based on talent or organization? 80-20 organization. Good people matter. You've got to have a pipeline of great talent. There's no question. And today, um, I'm going to hopefully promote some of what you're doing. You, can, you don't have to own talent to access it. You can get them through the cloud, through your services with Deloitte and others. But if they don't create a great team and a great organization, the all-star team is not as good as a well-conceived well team. And when we saw that, we see it everywhere in sports. 20% of the time, the leading score in basketball, in hockey, in team sports is on the team, in soccer, is on the team that wins the championship. It's teamwork. It's organization. Our ability to put individual players together through leadership is what we have discovered. Staying on this theme of uh or organization, you, you also talk about this market-oriented ecosystem. So how is that related to all of this? It is so helpful. I think legacy, and again, you've seen, I love to evolve ideas, and I hope the best is yet to come. But when we looked at organization, our foundation was organization is structure or morphology. So you look at shape and size and how many roles and who has what role. We then looked at, at organization as systems. You have the 7S model. You have the health index that a consulting firm uses. And you got to align the star of the system. Then we looked at organization with C.K. Prahlad's brilliant work as capabilities. Disney has the capability of a guest experience. Apple has the capability of innovation. We now believe the next step is that those capabilities are embedded in the ecosystem, not just in the structure. So our ecosystem with Tencent and Alibaba and higher, not higher as much as Huawei and Supercell and Google, those ecosystem organizational forms contain capabilities. And it's the capability, not the morphology, that helps you succeed. I love to ask the question, when you draw an organization, and even to this day, most people draw some form of a hierarchy. 
that's not the mental image. We need the organization to be a set of resources that create value for the external customers. And those resources can be capability or, or capabilities both inside and outside the formal organization. So the, uh, the COVID-19 crisis, uh, how is that accelerating some of these phenomena or, or is, is it uh, impeding some of these things? Yes, both. Um, on the one hand, I see a lot of individuals, and I'm going to include myself, uh, my wife and I tend to be on the conservative side of sheltering. I, uh, where are you on the liberal or con uh, open and, and active and public versus more private? Where are you on that scale? Probably somewhere in the middle, yeah. Yeah, we're, we tend to be on the conservative side. Um, and I'm discovering there's a pandemic malaise. My wife and I have now been together seven days a week, 24 hours a day uh, for four months. Um, you know, <laughs> once in a while, we each have to go to our separate office. Uh, and we're 44 years married in a delighted way. So I think there are some individuals who are feeling this pandemic malaise. On the, and there are some organizations that are kind of stuck. Our past didn't work. How do we get out of it? On the other hand, those are people who feel more threatened. I like to discover opportunity. What are the opportunities this brings? I tend to be, I'll use myself as a silly example, I tend to be a huge 10-0 introvert. When I go uh, speak on conferences, I'll do the session on stage, then I hide in my room. I've now had to work out of my office for 14 weeks. And so I do stupid stuff like show pictures of my family. I've got to stretch myself to go out of my comfort zone. And I hope that's discovering new opportunities. Organizations have to do the same. We cannot simply do what we've always done. We've got to leap in a strong way and start to experiment. So I think the coronavirus is a context. By the way, it's not alone. I think you combine the coronavirus, the racial strife that is so difficult to manage, and the economic downturn for many. Those three combine to being a new external context that I think will shape the future of work if we discover opportunity. Any, any, any parting words for our audience? This has been great. You know, I, just to model with your audience, you've interviewed some, some of the most incredible pioneers. When I look at your website and your research, what's one message? And I know you've had a lot of people share their message. I'm committed to learning so I can create new things. What's one message you would share with your audience based on what you've heard from so many people? I, I think despite everything that's going on, these various factors you mentioned, uh, the, the new context, if you will, uh, despite all of that, there is a great deal of optimism that there is a lot, a lot of good that's going to come out of this and uh, things that were going to happen five, 10 years down the road, they've already started to happen because uh, we, we need to reinvent ourselves. Nice. Uh, so, so, the, so I think that that's the, the theme I've been seeing through these interviews. You know, I really love that. I, uh, I like to end the talks I've done in the last few months with five words. The best is yet ahead. Um, the best is always yet ahead. That doesn't mean the easiest is yet ahead. It is really hard to change, uh, but the best is yet ahead. And I commend you for helping discover not yesterday's pioneers, but tomorrow's pioneers who will create that unknown future. Well, you're one of them, Dave. So thank you so much for your time today. Thank you.